Hello and uh, welcome. My name is Tom Dean and I uh, serve on the Board of Trustees of the Iowa City Public Library as well as the uh, Weber Days Organizational Committee. This is the annual Weber Lecture, which is part of uh, Weber Days, our annual celebration of local history. And it's also a celebration of Irving B. Weber, uh, who was a lifelong Iowa City resident. He passed away in 1997. Uh, a local historian wrote many columns for the Iowa City Press Citizen on local history uh, and became Iowa City's uh, official historian. So this is a celebration of all things history and all things local and regional history as well. Um, we are very pleased tonight to have uh, Tim Walsh with us. He is our Weber lecturer for this year. Um, Tim is the Emeritus Director of the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, which is one of 13 libraries within the National Archives and Records Administration. It is the first presidential library, as we know presidential libraries today. And uh, Tim is the longest serving director in the history of the Hoover Library. He was educated at Notre Dame in Northwestern, and he is the author or editor of 17 books on various topics, including Herbert Hoover and Franklin D. Roosevelt, a documentary history, as well as Herbert Hoover and Harry S. Truman, a documentary history. Uh, and his next book is Herbert Hoover and Dwight D. Eisenhower, a documentary history, and that will be published in July. Uh, Tim is also the author of more than 250 essays and reviews in a wide range of popular and professional publications. And his opinion columns have appeared in more than three dozen daily newspapers across the United States. And uh, I'm always very happy uh, to, whenever something of importance happens uh, on the national scale, to look in our local newspaper to find Tim's column on how Herbert Hoover is connected <laughs> with, uh, with whatever has happened. So. <laughs> Uh, Tim is frequently quoted on the, uh, on the role of former presidents in public life, as well as on the growing importance of the vice presidency in publications such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, and USA Today. Uh, he's appeared on many cable television news networks, including MSNBC, CNN, C-SPAN, as well as on CBS, Fox, PBS, and on the Irish and Australian national television networks. Uh, as I said, he is Emeritus Director uh, in, in his retirement. He is a volunteer at the University of Iowa Main Library. He is repairing books that were damaged in the flood of 2008. And uh, he also volunteers with the State Historical Society of Iowa here in Iowa City, where he writes articles for Iowa Heritage Illustrated and assists with the NEH project to digitize selected Iowa newspapers. And speaking of uh, digitizing, uh, we also invite everybody back here tonight, or tomorrow night, uh, Thursday, uh, for our next Weber Days event, which is the launch of the Iowa City Public Library's local digital history project. So that'll be at seven o'clock here uh, tonight. But uh, tonight, we, tomorrow night, uh, tonight we have the Weber Lecture, and let's welcome Tim Walsh. Thanks, Tom. Well, tonight we're going to talk about presidential libraries, which is a subject close to my heart uh, after 18 years as director and actually an additional five years as assistant director at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library. But I want to start by talking a little bit about the title, which is the third term, uh, the role of place and personality in presidential libraries. The third term, of course, is a reference to the fact that because of the 22nd Amendment, Presidents of the United States can only serve two terms in the Oval Office. And, and then they devote really the, the rest of their lives to sort of polishing their legacy. And where that uh, spit and polish begins to take place is in the evolution of their presidential library. They devote the first years after leaving office, whether it's after four years, a single term like President Carter or President Bush 41, or after eight years, uh, to uh, building, designing and building the presidential library, to uh, organizing and processing their papers and records, to uh, establishing education programs and holding conferences, and then to doing good works. In most cases, these presidential libraries serve as the locus for charitable and humanitarian activities that we've seen. Uh, the Global Clinton Initiative, for example, does have activities both in New York and down in Little Rock. And we'll begin to talk a little bit about uh, the buildings themselves, how they evolved, and how we ended up with this system of presidential libraries. 
Now, the first thing we really have to talk about is what is a presidential library. And what I can tell you right off the bat is it's not a library, not in the conventional sense of the term. There are no DVDs. There are no circulating books. There's no children's room to speak of. Uh, essentially, it's a term that was devised by Franklin Roosevelt, who is the father of the first presidential library, so to speak, because he didn't like the term archives or museum. He thought those words were too stuffy. He said no one will come to an archives or a museum, but people will come to libraries, and so we'll call our building a presidential library. And it was Franklin Roosevelt who decided in the late 1930s to uh, basically design and build a library on the grounds of his uh, family home in Hyde Park, New York, where he was gonna go and work and write books. He was gonna have a, a little museum there where people could visit and go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, see some of his trophies. Uh, and that building opened in 1941, a very small, relatively modest building, as we'll see from the slides. Uh, and that was the first presidential library. So starting in 1941, although Herbert Hoover is the first chronologically to have a presidential library, it is Franklin Roosevelt who establishes the first presidential library building. Uh, and the system has evolved from there on. And each one is as different from one another as the presidents themselves. We are something of a family, that is 13 brothers at this point, no sisters yet, but someday. Uh, and uh, in effect, um, each one is as different from the others as you can imagine, even though we share a common DNA. All of these libraries have museums. All of them have uh, research centers. All of them have conferences and programs. All of them have education and outreach. Uh, and all of them focus on the life and times and legacy of one particular individual. And that's what really constitutes the third term. Now, before we got to presidential libraries, of course, we did have presidential papers. Every president, starting with George Washington, left office uh, with a large body of presidential papers. But until 1978, these papers by, were considered by common law to be the property of that individual president. So George Washington and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and on and on and on packed up their papers and documents, not necessarily those of all their cabinet officers, but their personal papers and documents, the documents that were in their office at, uh, in the, the White House, and took them with them. And these papers ended up at different locations, generally held privately, until the Library of Congress in the late 19th century made an effort to collect as many of the papers of the presidents as they possibly could and locate them in the Library of Congress building, in the manuscript division. And to this day, the Manuscript Division of the Library of Congress has the papers of 22 presidents of the United States, the largest body of presidential papers that, uh, that are available at any single location. And those, of course, are available for research. Uh, but there's no museum necessarily at the Library of Congress that's associated with that. Now, there are museums related to the presidency associated with the Smithsonian, but the papers of those first 22 presidents or so are located at the Library of Congress. What happens after President uh, Coolidge, who donates his papers to the Library of Congress in uh, 1929, uh, is that uh, Herbert Hoover makes a decision to break that tradition. When he leaves office, he takes his papers with him, as his predecessors had done, but deposited them in what was then called the Hoover War Library which was a building on the campus of Stanford University, which is now known as the Hoover Institution. And that's where he intended to store his presidential papers. And following, of course, President Hoover, you have President Roosevelt, who serves two full terms, fighting the Great Depression, uh, and then receives a letter from the Librarian of Congress asking him to deposit his papers at the Library of Congress. And so the story goes, uh, President Roosevelt went to the Library of Congress, to the, what is now the John Adams Building. At the time, it was a, a, a Depression-era construction project where they were storing a lot of the presidential materials. And the story is that, of course, inside buildings, President Roosevelt often used a wheelchair. But the story was that the aisles were too narrow in the stacks of the Adams Building for Roosevelt to get his wheelchair through the stacks, and he said this wouldn't do because he intended to be an active historian once he left 
the presidency, and he wanted to have access to his papers. And so the story goes, whether it's true or not, I can't verify that. There's no document that says that's true. But he made a decision late in 1939 or so to, uh, excuse me, 38, to build a presidential library at his home in Hyde Park. And that was the first presidential library. It was dedicated in 1941. Interestingly enough, it was the same year, in fact, that same summer of 1941, that Herbert Hoover dedicated the tower on the campus of Stanford University that is now the Hoover Institution. So the Hoover Institution and the Roosevelt Presidential Library open in that same year. But the nation has only one presidential library at that point. It's Franklin Roosevelt's, and he makes a decision to uh, turn this over to the National Archives and Records. Uh, actually, it was called just the National Archives of the United States at that point, which was an agency he established uh, to administer the, the, that presidential library. And of course, every president after Franklin Roosevelt made, his, made the decision that it was a wonderful idea to have a presidential library, and each one since that time has uh, opened his own presidential library. So what we will do now is to take a little trip around the country from Boston to Austin to Simi Valley and look at our nation's presidential libraries. We'll take a look at the architecture, talk a little bit about the history of those uh, particular buildings. Uh, and this is very much in the spirit of Irving Weber who could look at a building and uh, you know, bring forth from it the, the story of the people who inhabited that building. So as you can see, we, we start with the, the, the purpose of our lecture, and it starts with the National Archives building in Washington, D.C., and I wanted to start with this building in part because, of course, we, this is the parent agency of, the, of all of the presidential libraries. It's at 7th in Pennsylvania. It's a John Russell Pope building. You realize it has uh, all of the, the, the classic uh, uh, architecture of, of kind of civic engagement this is, of course, where the Declaration of Independence is and the Constitution of the United States. And if you've not seen those documents, they certainly are worth your time. I will say this, though. We, we have virtually loved the, the Declaration of Independence to death. And no matter how uh, much effort has been put into trying to restore the document, because it was uh, put up in sunlight for so many years, uh, it's, it's badly faded. I will say this, there is an Iowa connection to that document, that great document, and that is that the paper on which the Declaration and the Constitution of the United States rest uh, is paper that was made by Tim Barrett, our own paper maker at the Center for the Book here at the University of Iowa. So this is the National Archives building, the parent agency of our presidential library system, and this is the more recent building, Archives 2 in College Park. This building uh, was constructed uh, in the 1990s, uh, in part because of the, the, just the sheer size and volume of papers and records. One of the themes we'll talk about as we talk about each of these presidential libraries is the growing volume of paper and documentation that has, uh, has come as a result of the growth and importance of this country and the growth and importance of the presidency. So this is Archives 2, and uh, before the resolution of the conflict over who owned uh, Richard Nixon's presidential uh, papers, uh, those papers were stored at Archives 2. Well, this is our own Herbert Hoover Presidential Library in West Branch, and uh, this is the, the uh, uh, renovation of the building in 1992. You can see if you look uh, all the way to your far right, you'll see the original entrance there. When the building first opened in 1962, in August of 1962, it was about 4,000 square feet. So just about a third of what you see here in this picture constituted that uh, initial presidential library. It was very modest. Uh, Herbert Hoover's heart, quite frankly, was at the Hoover Institution out at Stanford University. He really had no particular interest in, in opening a presidential library here in West Branch, but the people of West Branch were so nice to him. They had given him a big birthday party uh, in 1954 for his 80th birthday. They, they had uh, beseeched him over and over again, let us build a small museum to go with your birthplace cottage. And so he relented, and they built a 4,000 square foot uh, presidential museum uh, to uh, go along with it. Very modest indeed. Of course, Harry Truman was here at the time in 1962, and he looked around at a very small museum, and he said, you know, Mr. President, this museum is too damn small. 
And uh, Herbert Hoover turned to Harry Truman and said, yes, Mr. President, but knowing the federal government, I'm sure it will grow over time. <laughs> and we're 44,000 square feet now, although still the smallest of the presidential libraries in the system. This renovation was done in 1992. I was pleased to be part of that, uh, in part to replace and renew the original building. One of the challenges faced by the federal government is the fact that they accept these buildings, which are donated uh, at no cost to the government. That is, the buildings are constructed with private money, but then they are accepted by the federal government, and uh, the federal government has to maintain them in perpetuity. They've accepted the documents because, as I said earlier, uh, under common law, this is the property of the presidents. The presidents turn those documents and records over to the people of the United States along with a building to contain uh, those papers, but it is up to the government to maintain it. Uh, and so uh, consequently, I think the budget now, presidential libraries, annual budget's about $67 million for the 13 presidential libraries. The size of the buildings and the cost of the buildings vary greatly. Uh, I'm pleased to say, in many ways, uh, the, the Hoover is the most modest, in, both in terms of expense, but as I said earlier, it is also the smallest. So the first chronologically, Herbert Hoover was president from 1929 to 1933, so a single term. There is about four million pages for Hoover's life and times his presidency. That constitutes about half of all the papers that he created in his lifetime, because about half stayed out in uh, uh, California, but about four million for his, his one term as president and uh, his rather extraordinary life as a food administrator and so forth. I want you to compare that to just for eight years of the presidential papers of George W. Bush, 30 million pages and 80 terabytes of information. Uh, and at this point, we're not quite sure how we're gonna access that information in electronic form or when it will be available. So each presidential library now, and here we are uh, not too far down the road in terms of years, but each presidential library faces uh, technical and electronic challenge, technological challenges, uh, and that, uh, that will, will uh, plague, I'm sure, future library directors. Well, as I say, Hoover's was the first, uh, and of course here's a, an interior shot. The museums have become increasingly important and making the presidential library experience. The word experience now is more commonly used in the museum function. Uh, and of course, we have a, a three-dimensional figure of Herbert Hoover fishing. Uh, he very much wanted his presidential library to be in the same vein as the other buildings, the cottage and other buildings that were in the site. He wanted to keep it fairly modest. The only thing I could say, I, I do regret that he chose a location for the library that's proximate to that Hoover Creek which has a tendency to overflow, uh, that's not the best location for a presidential library. We think we've got the problem uh, at least contained, but uh, you know, you'll always worry as a presidential library director, is water gonna get into the building? Well, this is the Franklin Roosevelt Presidential Library in Hyde Park, New York. For those of you who know local politics, Hyde Park is a Republican community. So smack in the middle of a Republican community is the presidential library and home of probably the man most closely identified with the Democratic Party uh, in the 20th century. It's a, a, a kind of a Dutch colonial style in keeping with uh, other uh, buildings in town and also with the other buildings on the site. Uh, fairly modest in size, as I say, opened in 1941. They are in the process now of renovating this building, but of course part of the money to renovate the galleries has to be raised privately and then the federal government is appropriating money to do some of the uh, the, the structural changes. Uh, excuse me, let me go back one here. Uh, this is the office uh, that Franklin Roosevelt used. Uh, it wasn't so much a personal work office uh, at the FDR library, but it was a, an office he used for his fireside chats. He's the only president of the United States because keep in mind, this opened in 1941. He regularly visited Hyde Park and regularly used his presidential library as a working office on the weekends and so delivered fireside chats from his presidential library. And so the fireside chats were used in, uh, at, uh, at Hyde Park. Notice the portrait there. Uh, this is Sarah Delano. Uh, and if you know anything about the history of the Roosevelt family, if you've seen Eleanor or Franklin or whatever, you know Sarah was extremely close to her only child. 
Uh, in fact, her wedding gift to Franklin and Eleanor was matching townhouses uh, in New York City, one for Eleanor and Franklin and the other for her, and then there was a passageway between the two. So, and in fact, she lived with them in the White House, so she was uh, very close to, uh, to Franklin, to say the least, and uh, I think Eleanor was something of a saint in dealing with Sarah, but that's another story. At any rate, uh, this is a room. Now, you cannot enter this room, but you can uh, observe and see that, which is fairly typical of traditional presidential museums. I wanted to show the car because, of course, we've seen lots and lots of pictures of Franklin Roosevelt in the field with miners and workers and farmers sitting in his car. And, of course, this vehicle is, is uh, fit, outfit with, with uh, hand controls that allowed Franklin Roosevelt to, uh, to drive the car as well. And, of course, very few people in the country realized that Franklin Roosevelt was a paraplegic. Uh, there are only two pictures of him uh, in a wheelchair. Uh, and in general, uh, photographs were never taken uh, while he was being lifted out of a car until he was set up and ready to speak. So it was, uh, uh, as one historian called it, a splendid deception. Well, the next uh, building to be constructed, the next presidential library, is uh, Harry S. Truman. And of course, Truman becomes president on April 12th of 1945, unexpectedly. This is where a situation no one would have ever thought that Harry Truman was presidential timber. Uh, but of course, uh, shortly after he's inaugurated as vice president in uh, January of 1945, he becomes president due to the, the death of Franklin Roosevelt. He leaves office in January of 1953 and has an enormous body of material that has come to him as a result of the Cold War. So the Office of the President and materials from the National Security Council and other materials have come, and he ships them off to Kansas City. It's his property. And he, in turn, uh, begins to think about the possibility of a presidential library. Uh, but there's no legal mechanism for him to go forward. Franklin Roosevelt was larger than life. He just built a library and gave it to the National Archives. And the Congress either was too intimidated or we don't know quite why, but they accepted it and it became... Uh, uh, you know, given law that it was uh, going to be accepted as part of the federal government. But when Truman left office, he was among the, the least popular of our presidents at that time. So he begins to lobby Congress for legislation that would allow the, the creation of additional presidential libraries. And finally, in 1955, uh, and you can see that President Eisenhower says, you know, that's not a bad idea, and someday I'm going to leave office, and perhaps I'd like a library. And so in 1955, Congress passes a Presidential Libraries Act for any living former president. Uh, so at that point, that would be President Truman and President Hoover. And that's the door that allows the people in West Branch to begin to press Herbert Hoover to have a presidential library in West Branch. But Truman begins to move forward full speed ahead. And so in 1957, opens this building. It's about 75,000 square feet. Keep in mind at the time, the future Hoover Library, which is going to open uh, in 1962, five years hence, is only going to be 4,000 square feet. Uh, Eisenhower's will be substantially bigger than that. So they're varying tremendously in size based on how much money these presidents can raise, what their vision of their particular presidential library is, how they interpret their third term and their role going forward. Uh, in 1957, Herbert Hoover, for example, is uh, 85 years old, almost 85 years old, and uh, has established his own legacy, he doesn't quite see the need for a base of operations. For Truman, this is going to be his home away from home. This, this building is located in Independence, uh, Missouri, which was his adopted hometown. Uh, and it's just down the street from his home at 219 Delaware. And he would literally walk to work. And he would spend his time in a working office at the Truman Library as a former president. So he never obviously occupied this as a president of the United States, but as a former president, he was there every day and would wander out into the galleries and give tours to the kids. Uh, and if, quite frankly, I mean, this is a great autograph opportunity for anyone in the late 50s or early 60s. You could go to the Truman Library and get just about anything you wanted signed. Uh, or talk to the president. And we regularly hear people come to us uh, at the Hoover saying that they once met President Truman. Here's Truman at the dedication of the groundbreaking in 1955. So it's now become customary that there are really two events associated with these presidential libraries. 
Uh, my wife and I were, were uh, fortunate enough to go to the groundbreaking for the George W. Bush Presidential Library. And that's quite a big event. There are literally uh, a thousand or two people there. And then, of course, they had the big opening uh, at the end of April for the George W. Bush Presidential Library. So we start with the groundbreaking, and this is the groundbreaking for the Truman Presidential Library. Uh, this is the Eisenhower Center in Abilene. You see the sign that says uh, library on it. Um, it wasn't because they had a spelling problem or didn't know whose name they should put next to the word library. But because on the opposite side of the mall is another building called that simply Museum. There's a much larger sign that says Eisenhower Presidential Center. Uh, what happened was uh, Eisenhower, of course, comes back to the United States uh, after World War II and is lionized as the man who saved Europe. Uh, and so the people of Abilene, Kansas, quite literally raised the money to build a museum, a war museum, to, uh, to Ike. And then when Ike leaves office as president in 1961, he wants to do something with his presidential papers, and they make a decision to build a library on the opposite side of the quad. So there is a multi-building facility at the Eisenhower Center that includes a library, a museum, it also includes the boyhood home, and just like Roosevelt is building his library at his home in Hyde Park, New York, and Hoover is building his library at his uh, home in West Branch, and uh, Harry Truman is building a library in his adopted hometown of Independence, you have an emerging theme with these first four presidential libraries that the home or the nativity, the place of one's birth is where you should locate your presidential library. That's a relatively stable concept until after Eisenhower. So for the first four, you see this tradition of the home being a part of the, of the uh, experience. Now there were, I think, six brothers, five or six brothers living in one bedroom uh, it's a wonder they didn't kill one another, but, uh, but they remain close, uh, and it, it's, a, it's a nice experience. There are some others. The Nixon, for example, also has a, a birth, uh, it's located at his birthplace, but they're not all. And again, the working office. Here is uh, Ike and Mamie uh, with a visit to the library in 1968. Ike had a working office at the uh, Eisenhower Library, although he did not visit the library as much as Truman. Truman obviously located it close to where he lived. Ike lived in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. They had a beautiful home in Gettysburg, which is now a National Historic Site. So he would regularly visit Abilene, but remember, once he went away to West Point, he was traveling the world. He only came back to West Point, or came back to Abilene for occasional visits. As I mentioned, this would be Abilene, Kansas, is where uh, the Eisenhower Presidential Center is located. Uh, the Kennedy Library. Here's an interesting challenge. Of course, we all know President Kennedy is assassinated on November 22nd, 1963, a great tragedy. Uh, we, there's a tremendous emotional outpouring, uh, a tremendous response to President Kennedy and his legacy and all of the things associated with it. There are numerous uh, uh, locations, streets, schools, airports, and so forth named for President Kennedy. And that added to the burden of where will we locate the presidential library. When President Kennedy was alive in 1962, he visited a location uh, on the banks of the Charles River near the Harvard Business School. And this is where he intended to have his presidential library. He had already thought about this. They had not uh, had the temerity to say, Mr. President, we're concerned about a museum. But of course, in 1962, John F. Kennedy, although he was admired by many, wasn't the person who he became in, in, in memory after his assassination. So that the circumstances had changed once President Kennedy had passed away. Uh, money began to pour in. And uh, the question was, where can we locate the library? Well, the folks at uh, Harvard University were reluctant to allow the plans to go forward, uh, the original plans uh, on the banks of the Charles River, because they were concerned about traffic. They figured this, this museum could, could uh, have a, a million visitors a year. Where are we going to put all these cars and vehicles? They didn't mind having the idea of a research center located on the banks of the Charles River, but they did not want the museum component. And by now, the museum and the library are wedded together. 
so the alternative eventually emerges that the, uh, the people of Massachusetts are filling in parts of Boston Harbor, and there will be land available uh, in Boston Harbor uh, near the University of Massachusetts Boston, which is one of their extension uh, campuses, uh, and also the Massachusetts State Archives. And so the Kennedy family uh, chooses to locate his presidential library near the, uh, the harbor that he loved. Uh, he was a, he was a, sa a, a, a sailor. Uh, he had uh, uh, sailboats, enjoyed uh, that, that experience. And so they've located the library there. One of the more interesting elements of this particular library that makes it different from uh, the previous ones, certainly from a, from a library like this, or the one that we saw of Harry Truman's, you could see, let me go back forward here. Um, the Truman is a very square, very traditional building. Uh, and the same is true with the Eisenhower Center. But this structure is very different. Very few right angles. This is an I.M. Pei building at the time that I.M. Pei is a still, still a relatively new architect. It's, it's uh, very striking, very bold. Uh, in fact, the vista from the, the Smith Center, which is part of this building, uh, is right out onto Boston Harbor. And when they do programs like this one, your backdrop is Boston Harbor with a, a sky full of these beautiful clouds and sailboats. I mean, uh, it makes even the worst uh, uh, speaker seem uh, much grander, you know, like as if you're walking on water. But it's a very unusual and unique building, uh, expensive to build and not always as functional. Although, again, because uh, the president's family and his reputation is involved, the idea was to come up with a prize-winning architect. And that will become a sub-theme of future designs of presidential libraries. So the Kennedy Library in Boston, Massachusetts, the president's hometown, so to speak, certainly his home state. He was born in Brookline. The, the home that he was born in is still there in Brookline. It's a National Historic Site. But the library and museum are located uh, in Boston uh, Harbor at Columbia Point, uh, and, uh, and there's uh, certainly sufficient parking. This is a replica of the White House Quarter. Another theme of the um, Kennedy Library is you are immersed in history. They, they worked very hard to draw you into the experience of what it would be like to visit the White House at the time of President uh, Kennedy's presidency. And in fact, several of the newer presidential libraries have adopted this theme. They have oval offices where you can sit in the chair. Uh, so again, the idea of the experience, how can we educate the people about the Kennedy uh, presidential experience? And uh, that's part of the motif here. Uh, this, of course, the LBJ Library at the University of Texas in Austin, and you can see uh, that uh, it's a very different, distinct building. This is a building done by Gordon Bunshaft of Skidmore Owings in Merrill. It's seven stories above ground and I think three or four underground. Now, what I want you to do is to keep in mind that Johnson, of course, leaves office in 19... Uh, 69, and uh, he, is, he is widely criticized, of course, for the war in Vietnam, you know. Hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? So this was a man who felt that he had been cast out by the American people. Uh, and he makes a surprise and sudden visit to West Branch to visit the Hoover Presidential Library, because by this point, having left office, he was now thinking about presidential libraries. And he visited West Branch, and they loved him. People came out, and there were these enormous crowds, and he was just deeply moved by the personal response to the visit that he and Mrs. Johnson had made to, uh, the, uh, to the library at West Branch. At that point, it's about 12 or 13,000 square feet, because we had had the original 4,062, and we'd added an auditorium and so forth. Well, so the story goes that Johnson goes back to Texas before this building is finalized and tells the staff, by God, I want to build a library just like that little library they got up there in Iowa. And this is the result. <laughs> Not at all. This, this replicates the, the, the vehicle from close encounters of the third kind. You know, it's, it's a, it's a very distinct building, and as if uh, one thinks that uh, it's only the exterior that captures uh, uh, Johnson's humility, uh, or perhaps not his humility, this is the interior of the Johnson Presidential Library. Those are red, custom-made archival boxes with gold seals, 
which initially kept falling off the boxes uh, because there wasn't the sufficient adhesive. But you can also see that Johnson, uh, and you, well, you can't quite see it, but here, uh, Hoover is here, and it's the progression of presidents from Hoover through Johnson. And you go up the stairs, and on either side, you have uh, theaters and you have the museum experience. But you get this overwhelming sense of, uh, of the presidency, the grandeur of the presidency. Uh, and again, it's all part of this Gordon Bunchef building. So regardless of what LBJ said he wanted, what he ended up with is something larger than life. The interesting connection here, too, is that uh, Johnson is the first of three presidents in Texas, and Texas is the only state with three presidential libraries, with libraries that are located on university campuses. So this becomes a new uh, thread uh, of continuity that we see, the connection between uh, presidents and universities. In some cases, they're alma mater. In some cases, not. In some cases, they are located proximate to uh, universities. In other cases, they're located right on the, the middle of the campus. And in this case, the library is located right on campus. Uh, it's, a, it's a very impressive structure visited by a couple of hundred thousand people each uh, year. Johnson was the first president to become very competitive about how many people visited his presidential library. And of course, he would look at Eisenhower and other libraries and want to make sure that enough people visited his library. In fact, he wanted to make sure he had the most visitors. And of course, Johnson would do whatever he could. First of all, he offered free admission. So he wasn't going to charge a dime. You could go through as many times during a day, and uh, that was fine with him. Uh, and the story goes, and I know this to be true, that uh, a story told by a predecessor of mine at the Johnson Library, who was the director, that when they had home football games at the University of Texas Stadium, you know, they had 100,000 people in those stadiums, and Johnson would look around and say, I got to get all those people into the Hoover Li or into the Johnson Library. And so he would tell uh, Harry Middleton, the director, said, Harry, you go up there, tell that public address announcer that his president says that he should tell everybody in this stadium to go over to the Johnson Library, take a pee and get a drink of water after the game. <laughs> and so, so Harry would wander away and Johnson would listen for that announcement and it would never quite come. And then he'd wander back to his seat and, and the president would say, Harry, did you tell him to say that? And he said, yes, Mr. President, I told him. I said, I'm sure he'll do it. it. Never would come because, of course, they only have one public restroom in the Johnson Library and one can imagine a line of 100,000 people waiting. <laughs> to take a pee and uh, uh, get a drink of water at the Johnson Library. But the Johnson Library has always done well, and they've had deep endowments. The private side of presidential libraries is, in addition to the money that comes to maintain the buildings from the government, these presidential libraries establish uh, private foundations that go out and raise additional money to renovate the galleries, to do the new exhibits. So even the Hoover has to go out and raise money to do their exhibits. They cannot do these uh, with government money. And the Johnson Library in, uh, received from the Johnson family a sizable inheritance that allows them to continue to, uh, to do uh, uh, wonderful things. Uh, there's also, and I don't have a picture of it here, in addition to locating on a university campus, Lyndon Johnson set up the LBJ School of Public Affairs. So many of these universities now not only have the libraries, the ones that are associated with the university, but they also have a school where they teach in the spirit of that particular president. And in some cases, they will have a research institute, like a think tank. So you have think tanks, schools of public affairs, museums, libraries, in some cases, birthplaces, uh, and so forth. And uh, they, uh, they just seem to keep growing. I wanted to talk a little bit about, oops, I think I hit something wrong here. Oh, there it is, OK. I want to talk about this area up here. This is also another innovation. There's a helicopter pad up there. One of the challenges, of course, for LBJ, who always wanted to move as fast as he could and have dried like crazy on his own uh, property, was to get from Johnson City, where he had a home, to the presidential library. And so they would land uh, on the helicopter pad on the top of the building. This area up here, too, is a, um, uh, a private suite, a presidential suite, where they could stay when they were in, in Austin. So that's, a, that's an element of, of presidential libraries that's relatively new that starts with Johnson. OK. I did want to show a picture of LBJ in part because one would presume if you saw that library 
and you saw the boxes that, that there would be some grand monument or mausoleum to his burial. But LBJ is born or is, is buried on his, uh, on his farm, uh, on his ranch, a very simple stone uh, uh, that uh, covers his grave. So it's in many ways Johnson is, is something of a contradiction, different, different trends and in, in, in different inclinations. And I think you see this, for example, in Robert Caro's uh, four volumes thus far on Johnson's life. Well, the next uh, in chronological order would be Richard Nixon's. And of course, this library doesn't open up until about 1990 because there is a, an argument. Uh, Richard Nixon leaves office, of course, in 1974 as a result of Watergate. And at that point, the tradition is to still allow him to, uh, to take his papers with him. Well, Congress seizes the papers and saying, we don't want you to take your papers because we, don't think you're, we think you're going to destroy the papers and documents related to Watergate. And they begin to argue in court and so forth. And finally, uh, Nixon goes ahead without regard to government support and builds this library at Yorba Linda. Initially, it was going to be up at, uh, uh, near Stanford University, and then it was going to be at Duke University, and it was something of a of a lost Dutchman that was going from place to place. They finally settle on a location near uh, his uh, birthplace cottage in Yorba Linda, California. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, uh, a modern architectural structure, although it is not necessarily a prize-winning architect. What is most interesting in a way about the uh, Nixon Library is this replica of the East Room, which is actually larger than the real East Room at the White House. And this room is used for weddings and receptions. It is a cash cow. Uh, it is owned and operated by the Nixon Foundation, and it generates income for the support of library programs. So it's a, it's a relatively interesting uh, place uh, for uh, multiple uses, although not a direct connection to the, to, to the presidency itself or the general work of the presidential library. So the, uh, the East Room replica is one that a lot of, of other facilities uh, uh, a lot of other presidential libraries have considered, and in fact, in most cases now, presidential libraries do rent out their space for various social functions. Although, because this space is privately owned, you can hold weddings and wedding receptions there. You cannot hold a wedding at a presidential library, uh, or, uh, or a, a funeral, I'm told. This is the uh, uh, Nixon birthplace cottage. This was constructed by his father from a kit. It's one of those uh, pre-assembled houses, that, and it, very modest indeed, uh, and it, it's again proximate to the, uh, to, the, to the presidential library on that same site. So in many ways what Nixon has done is gone back, it's a throwback to what the first four presidential libraries did in terms of constructing their, their library on a, uh, on a site near the home where they were born. Uh, the Ford Library presents an interesting challenge, and again, this is where you see both a connection to the community and a connection to the university. Jerry Ford, in 1965, draws up a deed of gift to donate his congressional papers. He's a congressman from 1948, and in 1965, he's still a congressman, anticipates retiring at some point uh, from Congress, but not really uh, achieving his life goal, which was to be Speaker of the House. Uh, he knows that's probably not going to happen, and he makes a decision to donate his papers to the University of Michigan, where, of course, he did his undergraduate degree. Uh, the, the deed of gift is signed, and then, of course, circumstances happen, and uh, he eventually becomes president, or vice president of the United States in 1973, and then president in 1974, and he's got a, a, a standing agreement with the University of Michigan to build a library, or to do, at least donate the papers, and so he basically holds to that agreement, and builds a presidential library in Ann Arbor. But Ann Arbor, just like Harvard, didn't want the Kennedy Museum. Ann Arbor did not want the Ford Museum. Now, they didn't anticipate uh, a million visitors, but they did anticipate a lot of visitors and made a decision, or at least uh, balked at the idea of taking anything more than the papers. The folks in Grand Rapids, the area of the, uh, Michigan, the area that Jerry Ford represented in Congress, uh, made a decision uh, gee, we'd like to have a museum, particularly right downtown where we're renovating the space. We have a great public museum, the Grand River. We've got a great location. And so on the banks of the Grand River in Grand Rapids, uh, uh, Michigan, 
you have the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum. These two institutions constitute one Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library Museum, and they're administered by a single staff. Now, there are some staff that are uh, assigned to the museum and some to the library, but they have a single director who goes back and forth from one, camp one campus to the other. It is, a, it is an arduous task to try to run the two facilities uh, at the same time, or you know, in, in, in the same week. She spends a week at one and then a week at the other. It is the only one that's divided of, uh, within the presidential library system. And there is now a, a standing agreement. The National Archives will not accept uh, two buildings, a single building for uh, a, a president, so, uh, or a single campus, I should say. There are multiple buildings. This is the stack area at the Ford Library. If you've never seen stacks, it does sort of have the ambiance of a, of a uh, a maximum security prison. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it, it's efficient, it's dry, uh, they do a terrific job there at the Ford. Uh, and again, the volume of paper has grown and grown and grown. I can't tell you off the top of my head how many million pages there are for Gerald Ford, but there are more papers for Ford for three years as president than there are for uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, for 12 years as president. And again, the copy machine, the size and the growth of staff, and then donated collections go along with it. Uh, various kinds of exhibits, at, both at the Ford Library and at the Ford Museum, and here's just some general pictures. Uh, you can see John Lewis up here. Uh, I'm not sure who the other guests are. Carter Presidential Library opens in 1986 uh, in Atlanta. Now, Jimmy Carter, of course, was governor of uh, Georgia. He had the opportunity to establish a library uh, at his home in Plains, which is a fairly small community in the southwest part of Georgia. He made a decision, as some presidents have done, that they wanted to locate their presidential library in cities of some size. They began to realize that these are places where the American people uh, will want to visit. Uh, he, they all want to attract as many visitors as possible, so they look for opportunities to, to uh, locate their, uh, their library in a, in, a, in a city of some size. And because Carter was governor of, of Georgia, they find a location in central uh, Atlanta for the uh, Carter Presidential Center. And he calls it a presidential center in part because, uh, as you might expect, after having been a president one term and dealing with a lot of challenges and problems and being voted out of office, the historical dimension of his life isn't necessarily the most attractive to him. Uh, and he was always looking forward. And so the, the Carter Center includes not only the library wing, but also his offices and uh, the, the humanitarian work that he does around the country. So he spends some time in Plains, where he still teaches uh, Sunday school, uh, but then he spends a large part of his time each, uh, 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 each week in, uh, in Atlanta at the Carter Presidential Center. And they have recently renovated their galleries, uh, particularly since he's received the Nobel Prize. Uh, I think I've got a picture. There's, this is uh, the, the replica of the office. All of the presidential libraries, uh, no, I shouldn't say all, many of them have replicas of the presidential, uh, of the Oval Office. There is a keen interest on the part of visitors in seeing the Oval Office, even though it's the same room. It is, of course, decorated differently each time with each president. It wasn't in the earliest years. That is, when Herbert Hoover left office, the Oval Office under Franklin Roosevelt appeared virtually the same as it did under Herbert Hoover. They didn't go through and redecorate. Now they strip it to the bare walls and, and each president decorates the uh, library as they choose. I believe this is the Resolute desk, the, the famous desk made from the HMS Resolute uh, that uh, was given to President Rutherford B. Hayes by Queen Victoria after the, uh, the crew of the Resolute was saved by, uh, by a U.S. ship. But anyway, it is a replica there of the Oval Office. And as I mentioned, several of them now have Oval Offices, and in this case, it's closed off. You cannot come into this space. But several of them now have a opportunity for you to come in and sit behind the desk in the Oval Office and have your photograph taken. Of course, you pay for the photograph. It's another uh, revenue stream, as we might say, to, uh, to help support presidential libraries. This is a Jimmy Carter with the, the Nobel Prize. Interestingly enough, his uh, grandchildren weren't so much impressed with the fact that he won a Nobel Prize as the fact that he has a Grammy for best spoken word album. Uh, actually reading his, uh, I think, uh, 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 An Hour Before Daylight, his book uh, of, of memoirs of his youth. 
Um, but Carter's still active, and he now, too, is the longest-living former president. He passed Herbert Hoover last year. Herbert Hoover was a former president for 31 years. Jimmy Carter now is, I think, 32, 33 years, uh, 32, I guess, this year. And, of course, still vigorous, still doing lots and lots of work on, on guinea worms in Africa and elsewhere. It underscores the fact that former presidents not only have this third term as a concept, but they continue to polish it and grow. And in some cases, as many people have said, Jimmy Carter is a very effective world leader as a former president. You know, I dare say there are many people he meets who know little or nothing about his presidency, but they know that he's a passionate advocate for social justice, for, for democratic elections, for uh, worldwide health, and so forth. He also is an active researcher at his own presidential library. His, one of his most recent books was called White House Diary, which he, he did use the diary, but then uh, added uh, uh, notes that go with it. And so he's an active user of his, uh, of, his own, of his own records and documents. That's what Franklin Roosevelt helped to do. That was something that Herbert Hoover did on a regular basis, and other presidents as well. A little, a little too far. This is the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, which opened very soon after he left office. He leaves office in 1989. This building is opened by 1991. And again, this was going to be opened on the campus uh, of Stanford University, and then they balked at the notion that they would have uh, hundreds of thousands, if not a million visitors. And so eventually, a, a site was located in Simi Valley, California, kind of northwest of Los Angeles. Uh, and it kind of overlooks the Pacific Ocean. They have a, a, a lot of natural growth around there, and there have been a couple of, of fires that have come perilously close to the Reagan Library. It is uh, the largest in terms of square footage, 240,000 square feet, initially 150,000, but because of this, they added another 90,000, you know? The plane, the plane, and I'll tell you something, this is a big attraction. It is owned by this Air Force One Pavilion, is owned by the Ronald Reagan Foundation. It's physically proximate to the library, uh, and you walk from one right into the other. So you wouldn't know that you were in the museum, but then you're walking toward uh, the, uh, the uh, actual Air Force One. You can tour Air Force One, which is far more modest in size than it appears in the exterior. It's not at all like the film. You know, if you see the film, it looks like the size of a shopping mall. But if you go into this plane, it's one aisle. It's like a 707. It's, it's about as tight as what lands at Cedar Rapids. Uh, but you can also have your picture taken at the top. I don't have one here. But uh, on the other side, you see this stairway that's coming down. This takes you up on the other side, and you can have your picture taken, as presidents often do, with the door open. And again, for a few extra bucks, you can take that souvenir home with you. They also have down, this is another gift shop. They have at least two gift shops. And over on the other side is, is the Reagan Pub from Ireland, which they actually took apart uh, and, re and reproduced on the floor of Air Force One Pavilion. And at the back end of the plane on the floor, they have space that's sufficient to hold presidential debates. The first Republican debate was held at the Reagan Presidential Center, again, because it's private space. You cannot hold a debate uh, at a, a regular presidential library, but you can hold it at private space like this. So this 90,000 square feet plus the 150,000 for uh, the, the Reagan Presidential Library makes it the largest in the system. And of course, uh, in his... Uh, lifetime and even in his years as former president, he would welcome guests. And, and presidents, when they're alive, I've often said to people, if you happen to be a, a director at a presidential library with a living former president, do your very best to raise as much money as you can because you've got a living former president. And that living former president makes a big difference in terms of attracting people to any event, to raising money, a letter from the president, even a former president gets noticed. Uh, and in fact, then you have awards and presentations, uh, old friends who were retired as heads of their own governments come, uh, awards are given, uh, it's, it's a, a, a really active place during the time the uh, a former president is alive. And of course, um, you, you have, unlike Johnson, who of course was, chose to be buried at his ranch, in this case you have Ronald Reagan being buried uh, on the site, on the grounds of his uh, presidential library. Mrs. 
uh, Reagan will be buried next to him uh, at some point. What's interesting about the, the role of the library director out there who is a friend is under California law, if you have responsibility for graves such as this, you have to get a California mortuary license. So uh, the, the library director there, in addition to uh, perhaps having uh, experience running a substantial size museum, also has to know quite a bit about uh, the care of, uh, of, of cemeteries. This is the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library and College Station, uh, which uh, at the time it was dedicated, George H.W. Bush kind of shrugged and said he was sort of glad his mother wasn't alive because she would have been embarrassed at the size of the institution, uh, that it was a bit too grand uh, as far as he was concerned. Uh, he's a very modest man. On the other hand, when you have friends who want to adulate and, and embrace you and celebrate your time as president and, and they themselves get from that a certain measure of, of self-satisfaction, you get institutions of this size. This is the second of the three uh, presidential libraries in California. This one is located on the campus of Texas A&M University. Johnson's, of course, is at UT. Uh, in this case, a. George H.W. Bush's is located at College Station, which is a fairly flat, low-level, one-story community, College Station, Bryan, Texas, and East Texas. And when you fly into their airport, you only see two things. You see the Bush Presidential Library and Kyle Field, which is their football stadium. Everything else is one story. Uh, it's an impressive building, uh, and again, it, it celebrates the life of a single president, but they have literally millions and millions of documents uh, that, that are to be processed. In addition to uh, this, this whole area that you see around here, are, uh, this is, I think, uh, the Bush School of Public Affairs. Uh, you've got a, an apartment, there are foundation offices. So again, it's something of a campus. Even though it's a single term president, the, the amount of, of space that it takes up and the amount of money that they raise. The, the Hoover Presidential Library, all of the money spent on the Hoover Presidential Library was about $8 million total, and that's four renovations, okay? Maybe $10 million total. Um, the, the, uh, Current fundraising estimate for the Obama Presidential Library is something like 500 million. Over 300 million was raised for the George W. Bush Presidential Library. It's all private money, but it still it shows the growing size of the institution, the footprints, uh, the activities, and the endowments that are needed to operate them. This is the Clinton Presidential Library in Little Rock, Arkansas, and we return to a theme that we had earlier. The, the uh, architecture is very distinctive, very different, just like Johnson's doesn't really fit in with the University of Texas campus, or the pay structure doesn't really fit in with Boston Harbor. This is very different from anything else in Little Rock. This is a James Polshak building, uh, and of course you can see that it's sort of, it's, it's kind of up on stilts and it kind of overhangs the Arkansas River. Uh, some critics have called this a double wide trailer on stilts. Uh, and this is the, the bridge to the 21st century. It's an old railroad bridge that has since been renovated since this was, uh, uh, picture was taken. Um, it is a, a, a striking building when you go in it. it it's, it's something of an homage to the old library at Trinity College. I don't have an interior shot here, but uh, Clinton, of course, was a Rhodes Scholar and, and uh, visited Ireland, very much impressed. The, uh, that's the first floor. The second floor is very much gifts. I think I've got a picture of one of those gifts that's there on display. This is a rather extraordinary structure. Um, Vicki and I were there for the dedication. It was November 4th, 19, or 2004. Got to be the most miserable day. Beautiful days on either side, and it rained like crazy, and you could not bring an umbrella in because the Secret Service was concerned that these might be fake weapons or something along those that were sitting there drenched. It was, uh, it was a pretty, pretty miserable day. So uh, these events don't always come off as planned. Uh, this is a temporary picture for the George Bush uh, uh, Library. I guess we don't, do we have the other picture? Oh, there's the other one too. When a president leaves office, of course, you, they're all reluctant to talk about it in the first term at all. They say, well, wait, after I'm, I'm, I'm uh, re-elected president. 
and in some cases, if they're not reelected and it's a shock, then the staff of the National Archives has really got to kick into gear and get all that stuff out of the president's office and all this stuff out of the White House and ship it to a temporary location. In the case of President George H.W. Bush, it was shipped to a, a, a bowling alley in College Station, and it was there for, for several years until they could plan and construct the library. In this case, I can't can't quite remember what the function of this building. It was an older federal building, and this was a temporary headquarters. Of course, again, with all of that electronic information and concern about national security, they had to have what are called SCIFs, Security Classified Information Facilities. And these are special vaults that, that uh, protect and preserve papers. And uh, this was located in Dallas, Texas, although not real close to Southern Methodist University. At the same time, they had completed their negotiations. Um, Mrs. Bush had a lot to do with the selection of Southern Methodist. It becomes the third presidential library in Texas located on a university campus. So we, re we picked that theme again. And we're also back to getting prize-winning architects. This is a building, now this is an artist's rendering, but this is a building that is uh, designed by Robert A.M. Stern, who's the dean of the uh, School of Architecture at uh, Yale University, very neo kind of classical uh, building uh, style, uh, fits in very much with the, the kind of neo-Georgian style at, the, uh, at Southern Methodist University. What, first of all, Laura felt very comfortable, Mrs. Bush felt very comfortable, she's on the board of trustees, she's a graduate of Southern Methodist. They live in Dallas, so the building uh, in the library enterprise is proximate to, uh, to where they live. There is a Bush Institute there, which is kind of a think tank where they're doing uh, the same kind of work they do at the Brookings Institution or at the Hoover Institution. Uh, there's also uh, a, a, the, the, this museum building, and then the library is physically separate because under presidential law, starting in 1978 and then again in 1986, they changed the law governing presidential libraries to uh, basically limit the amount of space the federal government will accept to 75,000 square feet, and that's primarily the space that's used for the storage of papers and the, the use of the papers, uh, the research room. Now the museums and other parts, the, the conference rooms, the auditoriums, and so forth, are paid for and maintained by private foundations. So they try to keep these spaces, although it's somewhat seamless to the, to the visitor, they try to make it very clear what space the government's going to run, what space the university is going to run, what space the uh, uh, foundation is going to run. So these enterprises continue to grow. Um, one of the challenges, I suppose, that all presidential libraries face is they are very popular with the general public. Over a million people visit presidential museums each year. They are beloved as far as... Uh, uh, you know, institutions to take your children, to educate your children. They're all involved and engaged in education. Uh, and and uh, consequently, um, there's no question about their popularity with everybody except Congress. And I suppose it's because the, uh, the members of Congress all think that perhaps they would have been a better choice for President of the United States. They think perhaps the spending is excessive. They don't have any regret about the documentation. I don't think there's any belief that they should uh, not accept the papers or even the memorabilia per se, but they do not like the museums. And so it may come to pass in the next, uh, uh, who knows, a couple presidencies, in the next 40, 50 years or so, that the, the nature of technology changes um, and, and the attitudes that Congress has toward the, the museum side changes to the point where the museums become separate and uh, they, they are operated privately, and that the papers, if they are almost exclusively electronic, may be maintained in Washington, D.C. There has from time to time been a desire to consider the possibility of building a single structure for just the documentation. Well, the, the, if the, 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 the uh, papers are primarily electronic in the future, it may be then that they, uh, uh, they do something differently than keep them uh, on any kind of a location. And I suppose the question about the Obama Presidential Library, first of all, somebody said, well, will there be an Obama Presidential Library? And there are very few things I'm certain of, but I'm almost absolutely certain that there will be an Obama Presidential Library. There are two institutions, University of Hawaii and University of Chicago, 
that are vying for the Obama Presidential Library, and all both have strengths, obviously. If you look at the previous presidential libraries, you can see that uh, to locate it in Hawaii, which is a major tourist attraction, would be proximate to where the president was born in Honolulu, certainly if you located it uh, you know, in, in Honolulu or in the Honolulu area. Uh, on the other hand, it would, be, it would require someone to take a trip to Hawaii, which is a considerable expense and would probably limit, to some extent, the visitation uh, of most people in the nation. University of Chicago offers real possibilities, but just like Harvard uh, or the University of Michigan, they would love to have the library function in Hyde Park, Chicago, uh, but they, they really don't want to have the museum. They don't have the space. They wouldn't want the extra traffic. So there's always the possibility, again, of a private Obama Presidential Museum located somewhere on the southwest side of Chicago and a museum uh, or a library of some sort affiliated with the University of Chicago in Hyde Park or both a library and a museum and a research institute and so forth located on the southwest side of Chicago but with an affiliation with the University of Chicago, just the same way the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the laboratory out in Batavia, I think, still has a connection, technical connection with the University of Chicago. So there are ways to work these things out. But each one of these libraries, as you can see, has its own personality. It has its own uh, variations depending upon the individual president, their ability to raise money, the sheer volume of the paper uh, associated with them. In some ways, also the length of their, their presidency and the length of their post-presidency. So it's a, uh, an interesting, evolving enterprise. Well, I've, I've certainly have, I've, I've talked for an hour, which is at, at the very least uh, too much. Uh, and I suppose I can open up if you have any questions about either what I've said or presidential libraries, I'd be happy to take them. They've got a microphone. OK. So that the people at home can hear the Thank you. Yeah, Tim, I'd be interested if you would comment on Richard Norton Smith, which uh, libraries he had a hand in developing. Thank you. Uh, for, for, for the audience, uh, Richard Norton Smith was the um, director here at the Hoover Presidential Library from 1987 to 1993, my friend and predecessor. And after, in fact, during the time he was the director of the library here, he took a, a year's leave of absence and was the director at the Eisenhower a library in Abilene for uh, a year during the centennial celebration of Eisenhower's birth. So he did both Hoover and Eisenhower during those years and then left to become director of the Reagan Presidential Library and then left Reagan to become director of the Ford Presidential Library and then left Ford to become the director of the Dole Institute uh, and then left the Dole Institute to become director of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library, then left the Abraham Lincoln Library to uh, take a job as biographer in residence at George Mason University. And as I used to joke with them, I said, I hope the creditors never caught up with you because it does show a kind of a track record of movement. But Richard was, was one of those restless individuals. He would get started. He would embrace a project. He would take it to the level that, that he felt um, was a good measure of achievement and then move on. And I said, for those of us who followed in his wake, we're like the local country pastor who follows the worldwide evangelist who comes into town and get everybody excited uh, because we try to have to hold on to that excitement and, and sustain it. So uh, only, the only other person to hold more than one presidential library that I'm aware of is uh, Dave Alsobrook, who is retired now, but he was a supervisory archivist at Carter and then went from Carter to Bush 41 and then from Bush 41 to Clinton and then retired. So most of us, we go to a presidential library and we're pretty much there for life. So. The, the libraries and museums that have the homes yes. on them in West Branch, it's the Park right. Service who's responsible. Is that the case for and the it's other? Not, you know, interestingly enough, it is, um, I believe at, at Nixon, the, the, the house is maintained by the National Archives, as it is at um, uh, Abilene, Kansas, the, the uh, uh, Eisenhower one. Uh, Hyde Park is maintained by the Park Service. So it's a split. There's no pattern. I know the National Archives would be happy to give up 
the maintenance of these homes. They are expensive. I used to tell people it cost $50 to build the Hoover Birthplace Cottage and $250,000 to restore it in 1992. They had to lift it up, build a foundation, put in a sump pump in the basement and so forth. So that maintaining these buildings is enormously expensive. Yes. You mentioned the Lincoln Museum yes. as one of them, but why was that not, well, not one of the three? The Lincoln Presidential Library, well, let me mention, back up a little bit. The term Presidential Library, which of course Franklin Roosevelt created, is a brand that many private libraries or private institutions like to, to, to add to the end of their uh, institution. So there's a Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library, which essentially is a home that, that Wilson lived in for two months in Staunton, Virginia, but they like the brand. Well, the folks in Springfield, uh, Illinois, very much, uh, clearly the land of Lincoln, very much wanted to have an attraction that would keep people in Springfield for more than a day. They would visit the law office and the home, uh, Lincoln's home, maybe go out to the gravesite and then leave. And they wanted them to stay overnight and they realized they had this large collection of personal memorabilia in the uh, uh, Illinois uh, the old capital, and they thought this could be expanded into a presidential museum. So it was a collaboration between the Park Service, the state of Illinois, the city of Springfield, uh, and a, a federal appropriation that led to the construction of the, uh, the Lincoln Presidential Library. It is not part of the National Archives. It is essentially a state agency. So it's uh, the, uh, the collection from the Illinois uh, State Historical Society that forms essentially what that is. And then most of the exhibits, if you've been there, the animatronics and so forth, are fabricated exhibits around the life of Abraham Lincoln. You know, they've got the war in four minutes. They've got a, a kind of a fake presidential uh, uh, debate, uh, as some kid said when he walked through. He said, I didn't know they had television during the Civil War. And you have to be very careful how clever you are. Bob Rogers' Imagination Arts, I mean, these are people who do all kinds of fantastic exhibits, did those exhibits for $55 million. You can do a lot with $55 million, and it's super cool. I mean, if you haven't been to Lincoln, those of you in the audience out there, immediately put down what you're doing and get in the car and drive to Springfield. It is, it is a terrific value, because it's a very modest fee, and uh, it's a terrific experience, so they've done a great job. And the current director at, uh, at the Hoover, my successor, was the deputy director at, at Lincoln, so. Anything else for the good of the order? Okay, well thanks to you all.